An overarching question that we have been looking at in our Sunday school lessons for the past month is whether or not you believe in Jesus. For example, in our Sunday school lessons last month, we took a look at Jesus' divine authority, even up to the point of him having authority over death, being able to raise the dead, being able to, to raise himself from the dead. And we were taking a look at whether or not you believe that Jesus is the only begotten son of God. There was a struggle. As I said in my Sunday school lesson last week, there was a struggle for many to believe in the resurrection of Christ. It was a struggle for many to believe in Jesus being the son of God, believing in his divine authority. Jesus, he is a stumbling block. In his fourfold witness, Jesus said to those who could not believe that he was the only begotten son of God, he said, take a look at my works. What do my works, what do they say about me? They are a witness of me. And that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here in our first lesson of April. We're gonna start taking a look at the miracles of Jesus by taking a look at the first miracle of Jesus here today. And so with that in mind, let's take a look at the first verse here in our Sunday school lesson this week. We're there in our first verse, we'll see that Jesus, he is in Cana of Galilee, where there was a wedding that was underway. It was a wedding that was in its third day. And so for those of you that may be wondering, well, the third day of a wedding, well, that was the custom. They would have the wedding and then they would celebrate the wedding. They would celebrate the marriage of the wedded couple. They would do that for over a week. They would do that for, for seven days. And so we'll see there for the celebration of the marriage, we'll see there again in that first verse that the mother of Jesus married, that she was there at the wedding. Uh, we'll see there in the second verse that Jesus and his disciples, that they were invited and that they were also present at this wedding as well. It is often suggested that, that Mary, the reason why she was at this wedding, the reason why Jesus, why he was invited to this wedding as well is because Mary, she may have been family of one who was getting married or she was close friends to, to the couple that was getting married. So she was invited to the wedding Jesus being the son of Mary, he was invited to the wedding for that same purpose and reason as well. Now when we take a look at the third verse, we see there that there was a major problem. The couple they had ran out of wine to serve the guest at their celebration of being married. And so again, it was on the couple to provide the food. It was on the couple to provide the drink for the wedding, for the celebration. And so we'll see there in the third verse that Mary, that she came to Jesus and she said to him, they have no wine. To which we'll see there in the fourth verse, we'll see a very interesting response from Jesus to, to, to his mother, to Mary. He said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And so again, that sounds very harsh, doesn't it? So why does Jesus say this? Why did he speak to Mary that way? What was it that Jesus was going on about? Let's try to bring some clarity to his response by first taking a look at Jesus saying, my hour has not yet come. What did Jesus mean by this? What did he mean by his hour had not yet come? Well, when we take a look at the 13th chapter of John's gospel, when we take a look at the first verse, we'll see that John, he wrote about Jesus knowing that his hour had come. His hour had come prior to the feast of Passover. It's an hour, John wrote, that Jesus would depart from this world. So Jesus's hour, it began to kick off when Jesus had that triumphant entry into Jerusalem, right, for the final week, for the week of Passion, Passion Week. It really kicked into high gear when Jesus, when he looked his betrayer in his eyes, it's scared, and he said, it is you, when it's scared, asked him if it's, if it's me, who will betray you. Jesus, he looked him in the eyes knowing that it was Iscariot that would betray him. And Iscariot, he got up, he left before the feast of Passover. And so when Jesus, when he was betrayed in the garden, it kicked in even more. His hour had come. When we take a look at the 19th chapter of John's gospel, we'll see that while he was hanging on the cross, Jesus, he said to Mary, he said to his mother, he said, woman, behold your son his hour was at hand. So Mary, she knew who her son was. She knew the true identity of Christ before she even conceived Christ. Let's remember the Christmas story, right? That we find in the gospels 
when the angel Gabriel, when the angel visited Mary and told her that she would bear a son that would sit on the throne of David, that would save the world. So Mary, she knew the identity. She knew the reason. She knew the purpose for why Jesus was in the world. Again, we know what the will of God is. The will of God is for all who see and believe in Christ to have everlasting life. The purpose that Jesus was in this world to give his life to save the world, to save mankind from sin, to become our propitiation. Now, did that mean that Jesus, was he not going to help Mary? Was he not going to help the married couple out who had ran out of wine? We'll see there in the fifth verse that Mary, she had turned to the service. It's like Mary was like that mom that would come up and ask their child to do something. And while their child has some kind of back talk, the mom turns away, walks away, knowing that their child is going to do what they had told them to do. That's almost kind of like what Mary did there. She turned to the servants, we're told there in the fifth verse, and she said to the servants, whatever he says to do, you do it, is what we'll see there. So Mary, if you think about it for a moment here, Mary, she goes to Christ and she says, hey, they have no wine. The, the suggestion here from Mary was, hey, you'll help these people out. You, I know that you have the power to help them out. It's almost like Mary was, was praying. It's like a prayer. Think about it. When you need something from the Lord, what do you do? You go to God and you talk to him. You ask, you make your supplication known to the Lord. And you have faith that God will move for you, right? And so that's, kind of what Mary has done here. She went to Jesus, she needed help. The family, the married couple, they needed help. And so she goes to Jesus, she asked for the help. And yeah, Jesus had his response, but she turned away having faith, knowing that Jesus would move, knowing that Jesus would deliver for her. And so we'll see there, we'll take a look at the seven verse that Jesus, he instructed the water pots to be filled up to the brim. Now, if we go back to the sixth verse, we are told there that there were six stone water pots that could hold between 20 to 30 gallons of water a piece. Something else that I wanna make a note of there as well from that verse is that the pots, they weren't fancy pots, they were stone water pots, which again, it speaks to the fact that this married couple, that they weren't wealthy. They did not have any fancy clay pots they had these stone, worn down, beat up uh, water pots. So when we look back again at that seven verse, we'll see something that is very important as well. We'll see that the servants, that they were obedient to, to Jesus's instructions. Again, obedience is listening and then doing. That's something that I have discussed recently as well in how we are to be obedient to the word of God. To heed the word of God, one must listen and then do. And we see that the servants, they did that exact thing in the seventh verse. Afterwards, we're told there in the eighth verse, Jesus, he instructed them, the servants, to draw some of the water out and to take it to the master of the feast, which they also did in obedience. We'll see there in the ninth verse that when the master of the feast, when he tasted the water, he didn't know where, where it had come from, we're told there. But after he tasted the water, he called the groom over. He said, hey, come over here to me. I have something, I have something that I want to say to you. Now, what was it? What was it that he had to say to the groom? If, if I try to put myself in, in the feet of the shoes of the sandals of the groom here, I have to imagine that this groom was probably, a, a, you know, stressing out a bit because they li he likely knew that they had ran out of wine. I don't know if Mary had told the, the groom that, hey, I went to Jesus and he's going to help us out. I, I would like to imagine that maybe she did that. So I have to imagine that when the groom went over to the master of the feast and to, to hear what the master of the feast had to say, I have to imagine that the groom was watching as the master of the feast as he drank uh, from, from the cup that was filled with, with this water. And I imagine that he's coming over to, to the, the master of the feast, the groom is, and he's looking kind of stressed, looking kind of worried about what it was that the master of the feast would have to say about what it was that he had drank. So we'll see there in the 10th verse, 
that the master of the feast said to the groom, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. So I think all of us get what the, the master of the feast was saying here, right? He's saying, look, you, say, you serve the best stuff on the opening day of the celebration, at the start of the party. Then you bring the worst stuff out at, at the latter part of the party, right? When, when people have had their feel, when they have gotten drunk. It was what the master of the feast says there. But he said, you didn't do that. You, you served us some of the poor stuff first, and now look, we're getting the good stuff. We're getting the good stuff now, is what the master of the feast is saying there. So what did Jesus do here? Because this, all we have seen, right, is that, that the, the master of the feast just drank some water. We didn't see any extra ingredients added to the water, right? All Jesus said to the servants was to fill the water pots up with some water and to draw water out of the water pots and to take it to the master of the feast and to give it to him to drink. And this master of the feast, when he drinks the, the, the water from, from his cup, all of a sudden, this was some of the best stuff that he had ever had. What happened here? How did the water change over to wine? I would tell you that it was through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we see something that I'm going to touch on here in a moment. I want to read the last verse here of our lesson. I'm going to just really take the 11th verse there. And then I'll touch on, on, on what, this, what this miracle, what it also kind of represents uh, in a figurative manner of speech as well. We'll see there in the 11th verse that the scripture says, this was the beginning of the signs, the miracles that Jesus, that he would go on to do to manifest his glory. So something that I like to mention when, when I teach this, this passage of scripture, when I teach about the first miracle of Jesus, the turning of water into wine, is that we see the Holy Spirit at work we see how the Holy Spirit works inside of us. There's a lot of figurative that we may miss here that is being represented here. For example, I like to talk about the stone water pots. You have the stone water pots, they are representative of us. We go through life and what does life do to us? Life, it, it beats us down, it weighs on us, it tears at us and we get worn down by life. We are those stone water pots. But when we come to Christ and we confess, when we make our confession known to Christ, there's something that happens, right? All of those who are of sincere faith, we receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes and abides within us. Something again that I mentioned in, in my sermon last week is something that we often forget something that Paul had to remind the Corinthians in his first letter to them, that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. For a brief period of time there, I would suggest to all of you, figuratively speaking here, that the water was representative of the Holy Spirit. And those stone water pots being representative of us, we see where the Holy Spirit comes and it dwells within the, the, the stone water pots, right? Again, I'm talking figuratively there the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. And the Holy Spirit works a transformative work inside of all of us who are of sincere faith, so that what comes out of us should be of the Holy Spirit. Again, remember what Jesus once said, it's, it's again what you, what you consume, and then what comes out of you, what defiles you, okay? Again, you, you can eat anything but again, what comes out is what defiles you, right? For all of us who are of sincere faith, what comes in us is the Holy Spirit. What should come out of us is the Holy Spirit, what is of the Holy Spirit. And what comes out of us should be love, what comes out of us should be grace, what comes out of us should be for the edification, the uplifting of all of those that are around us. What should not come out of us is lies, schemes, scams, deceptions, conspiracies, gossips, rumors. What should come out of us again, as you heard me say in my sermon last week, is the divine truth. What should come out of us is what is holy and what is righteous. What came from the stone water pot, the water that the master of the feast drank, came from what was holy and righteous. And it was the best 
that he had ever had. And so again, I, I hope that that's something that we take into consideration as well. You know, when we think about Jesus turning, to wa turning water into wine, we literally think of the, the turning of water into wine. We don't think often of what it also represents as well. You and I, we are sinful creatures, but when the Holy Spirit, when he comes and makes a home in us, when the Holy Spirit abides with us, we are able to move in a way that is holy and righteous, and it will please the master of the feast. It will please the Lord. So that is certainly something that I hope that you would take into consideration. That is something that I hope that you will draw away from our Sunday school lesson this week, that the Holy Spirit comes and works inside of all of us. We ourselves, we are also miracles of the Lord. Do you believe that you are a miracle of the Lord today? I hope after this, I hope that you do. Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. As always, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you will take something away from this lesson, that you will apply it to yourself and that you will share it with someone somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our Sunday School lesson next week. Make sure that you're following this channel so that you can get the next notification for next week's Sunday School lesson so that you don't miss it, so that you don't miss the Sunday School lesson, the sermons, the Bible studies, or the Food for Thoughts. Make sure that you're following this channel today.